Hello! I am very happy to be with you to contribute to our mythical nature with amulets, Greek and Roman amulets leading us to contemporary jewelry about the secret agency of nature and animals in the life cycle of young individuals in the past and in the present. We will look through two examples at how these little objects that were ubiquitous in ancient daily life, especially for individuals at risk like children and women, could represent an important form of care in agency in a time of high mortality. But in fact, these objects were also associated with little stories, little stories that still exist today and that we will discover, discover together. This research is part of the ERC Locus Ludi project that aims to understand and recover children's and women's past culture in antiquity, so an oral patrimony partly lost, children's law as part of a collective voice, and the modes of transmission and reception, innovation to of this law, through rhymes, through songs. Our model is Andromache Karanika, Voices at Work, Women, Performance and Labor in Ancient Greece, who managed to reconstruct part of this patrimony. But more remains to be done. So for today, I will look at two critical periods in the life of young individuals. First, I will look at amulets and historiolae associated with teething and tooth rituals between past and present. That is to say, for antiquity in, within the first heptoman, between birth and seven years, and when looking at amulets associated with coming of age, and especially for girls, from girls to wife. So let's first have a look at amulets and the stories associated with teething and tooth rituals. There are interesting contrasts between antiquity and today. In antiquity, the first hebdoman was absolutely crucial. From birth to three years old, the protection of teething was an important part of the protecting care that was developed around the child. Teeth were believed to be developed in uterus and as well as with breastfeeding. That's why we still speak about milk teeth. And the weaning period was also a time of danger because you change rhythm, you change regimen, and, and any change is, is difficult for the children, believed to be difficult for the children. In the seventh year, the, seventh, the end of the abdomen, we have the end of primary dentition, the loss of the first teeth. And what happens then about uh, rituals? Did rituals exist? Hippocrates, just to show you quickly what we have as among medical doctors, insists a lot about this first age. Little and newborn children, he writes, are in danger when for all kinds of diseases. Any 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 disease can prevent them from feeding properly, sleeping properly, and hence all that can lead to death. Especially at the approach of dentition, he writes, especially when cutting the canine teeth. Then you can have fever, convulsions, diarrhea, and all this can lead to death. He even dedicates a whole treatise to teething, De Dentitione, which in fact dates to the Roman period. In in art, in uh, ancient iconography, we have a number of children, especially boys, wearing this kind of string of amulets. They are not easy to distinguish, but what is interesting is that we see divine children with such a range of amulets or heroes like Hercules, though they should be strong enough. But this is part of the attribute of childhood and protection of childhood. Then, on these pictures, it is difficult to distinguish what kind, what kind of specific amulets they were. Sometimes it is possible to distinguish them, as on this marble copy of a Hellenistic statue in the Vatican, and you see the importance of the natural world. We see leaves, we see clover, we see dolphins, we see lunulas of the moon, all those presiding about the, on, on the health of a child. So, teething 
For the ancients, well, the moment that is crucial is the cutting of teeth, not the loss of teeth, the cutting of teeth. And this is associated with modern proverbs, so it goes on until and it is kept in modern proverbs, that this time is especially difficult. And in Zahnensterben, you could die of teething. It was long believed. Soon toothed, soon with God, mourir des dents. And this explains why we find clusters of such amulets among in tombs of children of that age, so between six months old and in three years old, when, when weaning stops. So we find all kinds of animals, teeth of cattle, as well as false teeth made of bone, but looking like impressive teeth. This idea that you could die because of teething stayed very long, and the doctor, Andres, uh, who's, who called himself a doctor for, for the poor in, in Berlin, says that he wants to write a treatise about it, because if you think that your child dies because of teething, you, you miss the point. In fact, they are dying of something else, and we must explain that, in fact, other problem must be addressed, and not teething itself, which is not that of a problem. So the whole book was written in 1836. Pliny explains how to heal this difficult period, how to protect that period, and we can relate the objects we find in tombs with what Pliny says, such as the first teeth shed by a horse, here we have a cattle, a cattle is not the horse, but it could, it could be synonymous, attached as an amulet to infants facilitate dentitions, dentition, and are better still when not allowed to touch the ground. Or we read that the dentition in infant is promoted and the gums greatly relieved by rubbing them with ashes of a dolphin's teeth. And this may explain why we find so many representations of dolphin or fish-like dolphin uh, in, in children's tomb. Because ashes of a dolphin's teeth, or the, the teeth themselves, were believed to be good for teeth in tooth for teeth. And if you had no such tooth, you could probably use instead the representation of a dolphin. And the hair too is, is important by, because by rubbing the gums of infants with hair's brains, tension is greatly facilitated, explains Pliny. And he goes on, I mean, explaining more in, de in detail how to proceed. And this could also explain he finds so many hair. And here's this false teeth. Just an example how it goes through the ages. In the 15th century, 15th century, we have a Regiment der Gesundheit von Heinrich von Lufenberg, and he explains that when your baby's teeth appear, you must be very careful. And what can you do? Take something um, supple and fat from chicken, brain from hair, and this full of on gums shall smear. Uh, these are a few examples of such sets of amulets. We find the fish again, false teeth again, we find also boar defense, and amber is very present. And amber birds, uh, and uh, here again, boar, boar teeth. Amber dove, and we will come back to these amber doves, the fish, and the hare. Amber comes back and back. Amber and goes through the ages until today. Uh, called lingurium, uh, because it was believed to be produced by the lynx, by an animal, and that its effect was very beneficial against jaundice, and we know that little children would often have jaundice, and it had to be attached to the body in the form of an amulet, even taken in drink or attached as an amulet to the body. What is very interesting is that in the modern period, teething is not so much um, ritualized, but the main, pro main moment is when you lose the first tooth or, or the teeth. And there are two main mm, stories, one about the tooth fairy, and in other circles, more French-speaking circles or Spanish-speaking circles, the little mouse. Uh, and in both cases, we have night visitors leaving a coin, leaving money for the lost tooth. The tooth fairy, allegedly, but more research should be done, uh, was promoted in the beginning of the 20th century, but certainly these authors um, use more ancient stories 
about the, the fairy really coming to the, to the child in, at night and taking the tooth and placing a coin instead of the tooth. Madame Donois in the 17th century in France wrote one of the first stories about la bonne petite souris, so not a fairy, coming at night and in that case it has to do with an evil king that must be kicked off and the little mice, mouse is very efficient and take out all his two teeth, which is not the same as, as what it has become. So many, in the, many stories circulate in youth literature about this little mouse, especially so in French-speaking circles. But we have something similar in Spain, where it, it also exists, huh? the Perez, the mouth, the tooth mouse, circulates and the first publication was 1894, well-known publication by Luis Coloma. It was dedicated to the King of Spain who was born in 1886 and age 8 he had lost a tooth and he received this booklet about the, the, the mouse come, coming to, to take uh, the tooth. This is to show you this, this protection for children in the form of teeth, in the form of um, all kinds of elements uh, were very alive in the 17th century still. You can find the little bells that we have also in, in Gallo-Roman tombs and even in, in Greek tombs and also horns, uh, maybe something synonymous with the teeth that we have seen. And I would like to greet Peter Sis, who has a beautiful book called Madlenka, who got uh, in 2000 a prize by the New York Times, uh, describing how a little girl who is feeling her tooth mm, moving and the tooth is loose and she wants everyone in where she lives in New York to know and so she visits all over places around, over, over flats and telling the Latin American grocer, the, the singer from Germany, the African American school friend and so she travels through the world uh, uh, looking for for reactions about the fact that she's losing a tooth. And it's quite striking that we have no such things in antiquity. This seems to be a modern period topic. And today there is one last change. The tooth fairy is becoming also a mouse. So we have now the mouse as a fairy. So there, there is a mixing of the two. The only example I have found comes from Asia Minor, a collective tomb, where in a bulla, so this is the golden, the famous golden Roman bulla, in the bulla there was inserted a, um, a tooth, the tooth of a, of a child, yes, you see it here, the tooth, it was a small bronze bulla with a milk tooth in it. So this is the only testimony I know, the only evidence I know of preserving a milk tooth in, in a special container, a, a bulla, which is something very precious. I may say a word about another, another deity protecting children's early life, which is the lion, lion snake, so the snake with a lion head with rays called knubis in Mm, let's say Roman glyptic. Uh, this snake, you will tell me that it's not obvious that he's protecting children. Uh, it's more easy here to see mm, the, the one uh, interpretation is that these stones are milk stones because the inscription says digest and digestion uh, is describes the process producing milk from blood, uterine blood into milk. And this lion-headed snake could be protecting this process, which was so crucial for children. And so this was more stone for the wet nurses, but maybe also for the children. You saw about uh, Hippocrates, how anxious one was about the digestion of a child. And in two, on two stones, there is um, an address to a child, most likely to a child. Because never, never you have such address with a name. Keep Proclus stomach healthy, or avert all tension, or indigestion, and all pain from the stomach of Julian, whom Nona bore. So here it's very clearly a child from a woman called Nona. So a woman making a stone for the child. 
and it could even be, have it could even have to do with worms, worms in the belly uh, that you could have, and why not worms in the tooth? Because we know that when the, the tooth is damaged, um, also a very old idea was that a worm was there and damaging the tooth. Where is the historiola? You will ask me. Well, maybe there is a lost myth, or a myth that every mother could construct and tell the child about Knubi's fighting monster, this, this uh, amazing lion-headed snake. The inscription is here, uh, say, Knubis, a uh, crusher of snakes, or giant slayer. Of course, he doesn't slay giants, he's slaying the small worms either in the belly or just the belly aches. In a sense, it's a bit like Heracles, uh, who was also fighting monsters. And this is a uh, clad to Katarzyna and to our mythical nature, because you have seen that there, there were doves in Amber. And this gravestone of a girl with doves may have a secret to tell us as well. You see how the doves are picking the lips of a girl. And the description in New York says, the little girl is shown in a moment of tenderness as she cradles her pets. In fact, maybe there is a historial love behind, and a relation to a famous story that was going round, and there we have a story about feeding the children. It is in Diodorus Siculus, after Ctesias of Cnidus of 5th century BCE, about the same period as, as uh, this relief. And it is about the miraculous survival of Semiramis, you know, the queen of Assyria, who was allegedly exposed as a baby in a rocky desert. And what happened? The baby was exposed, but a great multitude of does had their nest, and by them the child was nurtured in a miraculous way. And how the doves kept the body of the baby warm on all sides by covering it with their wings, while others brought milk therefrom in their beaks and fed the babe by putting it drop by drop between its lips. And I think that this relief, which is a funerary relief for a deceased child, has to do with this miracle, and maybe the miracle going on for the child after the death. Now, what about amulets associated with coming of age, from girls to wife? And from girl, it can start very early. It's mm, quite clear that you become a girl ready to become a wife as soon as your anatomy shows something of, of dis distinguishing girls and boys. So it can come quite early at about eight years old, um, much before you can really marry. And this string of miniature gold amulets tell us a story as well. And the story, of course, is lost, but maybe you said every element was part of something that could be told to the child when the child acquired it. It dates to the Hellenistic period, and whatever is the age of a child, because it has not been really well collected, whatever it is, uh, this, is this was a small child, it was before marriage. So we have a very quick look at the elements. We have all kinds of this language uh, of protection. Uh, the standard one, the open hand, the phylacterium where you put uh, a lamellae with a prayer, a double axe. You have also the club of Heracles, the head of Silenus, and also this knot that may be also associated with Heracles. Most important, and that's why one can believe this was a girl, you have a pomegranate having to do with rites of marriage. By eating a pomegranate in the underworld, as you know, Cori Persephone confirmed her marriage with Hades, so it has to do with marriage. You have also elements of play, such as the knuckle bone, the knuckle bone relating also to, to the cattle, the cattle producing the milk, the milk which is also feeding the child. So it's something very complex in the Greek world, it's not just for play, but it has also to do with divination, um, divinatory dimension, having to do with divining the fate, having a good or bad marriage. There is even a spinning top, uh, a skill game, that can relate to risk and chance, the, the play of a girl, huh, having to, to do with, with that. 
and there is a tortoise. So we find again an animal, the tortoise, that can refer to the play of girls, Kelly Kelone, and Andromache Garanica has worked on this game. Um, the tortoise is a girl's game, um, explains Pollux in the second century AD, and in that game the girl incorporates her fates. She sits in the middle of her friends, she's called the tortoise, and the others are running around her asking her, Tortoise, what are you doing in the middle? I am weaving wool and Milesian thread. So she behaves like the right woman, the right woman looking for, caring for, uh, weaving for the house. Then they shout back, what was your son doing when he died? So in a minute, she's not just a wife, she's a mother. And she's, of course, the mother of a son. And the son, of course, has died. So she's incorporating also all that. From white house horses into the sea, he was jumping. And at the minute she says jumping, says Pollux, the girl jumps and, and tries to, 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 to get another girl in the middle and they start running around the new tortoise in the middle of them. So it is a story of initiating the girl to, to, the, to the fate that, that belongs to her to become a, a wife, to become a mother, to both sons and to be able to stand the fact that they will die. The funerary pyre here that you see contained in Tazos a set of silver amulets, very interesting set with all kinds of animals. You find a tortoise and now we understand why. We find also a cicada and the cicada has another symbolism, it means becoming a nymphe like the cicada, it has the same the same, the larva of, of, of a cicada, the same word for both, like the girl who will become a wife. We find again uh, um, a knuckle bone and a frog, the frog being associated with fecundity, uh, and, and you see here the, the, the frog more in detail, so all these silver amulets, double axe and a clover. The clover is interesting because the, the, clever, the clover relates to meadows, like a fertile meadow, like the body of a girl who will be pregnant and have children. I will finish with these pixies from the Benaki Museum, where on one side, so box, you know that women in box, this is something very important, we have a marriage necklace depicted on one side. Uh, on the sides you have the marriage earrings, and on the other side, partly erased, you have a set of amulets. And this set is fascinating because we find, again, the same vocabulary. Phylacterion containing a prayer, the clover referring to the meadow, the meadows of Artemis, but also of Aphrodite, the cicada, the cicada is here, and the cicada being the nymphes of the girls ready to be married, the hand, the dolphin we find again, the saver, the dolphin protecting children, and crescent-shaped pendants, and the same as here. So to conclude, it is fascinating to see how these laws go through ages, and how people still today feel like relying on similar objects and similar products, like amber, amber for young children, and for the teething, but now we know that it comes, that it is something vegetal, that it is from raisin. And also how you now build a memory of your life, of your life cycle. Um, perhaps the most famous example is the Pandora sets uh, that you can build, build yourself. And when you look at the catalog of the Pandora sets of beads and they aim just the same age stage than in antiquity, so girls, girls on ready to be married or with early mar or just married with the first child, and you can collect all kinds of elements, um, keeping the memory of times in your life that was important before the marriage, and you find a tortoise, let's say it's like a lunula, uh, you find again the clover, you find the frog, you find the fish. And you find the snake. I had no time to speak about the snake, but of course snakes are also very important for the protection of children and of girls. I thank you for your attention and look forward to exchanging with you live tonight.